It is good to have you here. And here we are in the Fences series. If you are new to the series, welcome. At the beginning of the year, we heard God quite clearly state and put to us that the banner over the year is God's plan. And I don't find any mistake in the fact that God brought us to a series that is exactly about the very thing that stood between Him and plan A. Isn't that crazy? Like God's original plan to show His goodness, His glory and His graciousness and all the rest of it was amongst His people. His decided people. And yet what stood between them and their breakthrough and their healer was offense. Just man-made constructs in an effort to do it right. I think that speaks to most of us. Jake said it so brilliantly in the first service. See, we're not doing identical services anymore. Think of Sunday more like a conference, okay? Like you don't know who you're showing up to, who's preaching, if it's a double up or whatever it is. But in the first service, Jake spoke about the word compromise. The first word com means to actually attach itself, to be part of. And he was talking about how the devil often gets involved in the second portion of the word, which is promise. And I love that he tagged that because the scripture he ended on What I'm preaching is the precursor to that scripture. It is just a chapter before. And in fact, if we are really going to stay in this word today, we may have to take it for two weeks because you cannot read Hebrews chapter three without preaching Hebrews chapter four and vice versa. And uh, I want you to know that most commonly for Christians, what stands between you and the promise of God is the things you've attached to it. Those things that aren't specifically exactly as he's named them, but you can't live without them. So you try to fuse the two together. I know you've called me to just confidence, but I don't think I could do that the way you want me to do it. So I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. I know you've called me to be generous, but I can't do that just yet the way you want me to do it. So I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. And I know you want me to be single and one day married, but I can't do it the way you want me to do it. So I'm going to do it the way I can do it. We learn quite quickly from Moses that doing God's plan your way doesn't result in the same way that you want it to. Moses is the epitome of what we can sometimes suffer through the subject of compromise is that the very people he was leading got there, but he was taken out because it is difficult sometimes to do it God's way. Today's problems started yesterday. Amen. All right, thank you, team. Let's, we're going to read a fair bit of Scripture, um, and we have to because it is actually kind of like a story, okay? This, this is a remembrance of, I guess you could say it's a remembrance of just, it is obviously a time before the fence, but it actually speaks to it. I want you to keep in mind if you're a, vel, a well-versed Christian like um, Fallon um, or, you know, um, I don't know who else is there here. Um, obviously, George Girotti, um, hours and hours of pouring through the scriptures. His wife would attest to it. Um, if you know that, then I want you to keep in mind Joshua. Okay, Joshua is a book where you've got the remnants of the people who were in captivity. They go through Exodus, okay, they go through a wilderness. And after all of that, it is finally time for them to get to the promised land. That thing that everybody's been waiting for, everyone's been believing for. It's like when everything's going to be good, everything's going to be amazing. We've been in the sandy wilderness and we could be in our promised land finally. And it reflects on those very people because what is ridiculous and crazy is that those very people who probably arguably could be the group of people who saw God move the greatest ended up denying God. Let's pick it up at Hebrews 3 for a second. We're going to read a fair bit. It's going to be like family story time. Some of you, out of all the times that I've said all the things in this service, that really got you. You were like, I like, I, this is my church. Family story time, I'm in. Well, I wish I had a chair now, an armchair that I could read it to you in. Um, so as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me. Not how you thought that was going to go. The time of testing, as in he was testing them and they actually tested him. When we don't, it's funny that our heart posture turns around what God is trying to do in our life. And while he's trying to 
actually see what we are made of, we are testing him, as if that is up for debate. Through the 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called... Okay, um... We're going to do that one again for the cameras. And people are only going to see the edited version where we got it right because we are a church in unity and unity commands a blessing. Okay. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called. Didn't even have to point to my church. So that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness, we have come to share in Christ. If indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As has just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Today's problems... Hate to tell you, but they actually started yesterday. Every one of them. Yeah, the surprising ones. I would say that as far as humans go, 99% of it is us. My dad gave me this poem once because he didn't know what else to give me at Christmas. And I was a little bit of a problem child, somewhat, in my teenage years. Like to deal in secondhand goods and more than one occasion, maybe engage in a police chase or two. Obviously, they were chasing me. (laughs) And so out of Christmas, he gave me this poem, and it says, life is 95% attitude and 5% what happens to you. But as a child, I rolled my eyes. I was like, sure, sure, Dad. You don't know my life. You don't know. You don't know what it's like to be me. Because... I'm going to put it out there for all the parents. And some of the parents, this is going to be therapy for you. Okay? And for some of you children, after this statement, call your parents and apologize. Okay? And it is this. I'm going to put it out there. And I don't know which one of the two it is, but I'll tell you right now that children are either um, uh, forgetful or ungrateful. Oh, some of the parents are like, my kids are here. I'm not going to say anything. Is this coming out of bitterness? I don't think so. Um, but it's true. Because, like, I come home, and I'll say something to one of my kids, like, hey, can you empty the dishwasher? And they're like, oh, I've been literally working all day. I'm like, you literally showed me your crayon work from school. And to you, that is hard, laborious things. Like, you literally, like, what color do I use? Like, do you know what it's like to have to grip something like this and write things? Like, I feel like they say crazy things like all the time. Like they would be sitting there eating a meal that we paid for and then I'll say something crazy like, no, dad, you can't have this. This is mine. I worked for this all day. How, son? How? I don't, I don't know that you have a bank account. And last I know, the man asked me for money for, at Chick-fil-A. He told me that it's his pleasure. Not you. But they're forgetful. They don't don't remember that. You know what I mean? Like you literally could build a fence and build a backyard and a house. And then the day they move in, because you've got to get them to put some boxes up there, they're like, really, Dad? Can't I just enjoy my room? As if they're victims. Like we cook, we clean, we pay the bills, we do it all. And for them, their craziest day was that for like an hour of the day, mom made us do all the house chores. You know what I mean? And if you're Hispanic, Gloria Stefan was probably playing in the background as that was happening. You know what I mean? In fact, growing up, if I heard like that Mi Tierra album, we're cleaning. We're just straight away, we're cleaning. In fact, sorry, Gloria, but I can't listen to you anymore without just the smell of Clorox 
in the air. I have to do it. It's like, oh, I love this song. Like, I've got to have it. So I don't know what it is, but I think children are either forgetful or ungrateful. And then I find this really massive problem, or maybe, you know, I'm just going to point it out, but God seems to call them the children of Israel. I don't know. Is it like they never graduated to acting like adults? Um, I don't think so. And I think he still calls us his children. And I think we've got a far better ability to forget what he did than honor and respect it and build faith off the back of it. And the thing is this, that if you forget what took place yesterday, you're begging for a limited tomorrow. But guess what? The Bible gives tomorrow a name and it's called today. You're going to arrive at your today. And when you get there, it's what you did yesterday that will determine the quality of that today. And it is also an almighty check from God saying, hey, you think you're awesome? Because here's the other thing that my children do is that once they worked one day, they'll never let me forget it. You know what I mean? Like if there was one day that they did like double the taking the trash out, like for the rest of my life, they're going to be like, dad, seriously? You want me to go, like, do you remember that time? I took four bags of trash out. You're going to sit there and look me in the eyes? Ask me to do something else? They will never forget what they did. Forgetting that today, that day called today, they've just watched Power Rangers all day. Done the heavy lifting of sorting through their Pokemon cards. Look, Dad, I just counted my toys again. So overwhelmed by what they want. That's the other thing. Rarely, this is what I, you know what the best toy that you could get a kid is? Whichever one, you haven't got them yet. <laughs> Christmas is like this. Oh! Ah! Whoa! And then they literally get to the end of a present buying fest which you have wrapped and ordered and paid for and starved a little and sweated a little and wondered like, Lord, can we tithe towards my children this week? Like, you have done all that. And then at the end of that present fest, they're like, I was kind of hoping. <laughs> for like a pony or something, you know? There's always a kid in school that's got something, right? There's always someone that has what we want. And there is the problem with today. We don't often live here. We definitely don't take account for it. And this whole Fences series is not about rules and regulations. It's the fact that we like to use rules and regulations over owning the status of a heart called on a day called today. Where is our heart today? This is what he's talking about in Hebrews. And you got to understand this, that there's a well-known verse that it is actually going to finish this whole sermon with, this whole writing with. It finishes with the fact that the Word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. It is both powerful to separate both bone and marrow. It is a weapon And Jake preached on it perfectly in the first service. You should download it. But why does it end with that and start with this? Because everything you have no faith for tomorrow started yesterday. Everything you have no faith for today, it started yesterday. And it started yesterday when you forgot what he did for you. It started yesterday when you forgot the proverbial seed that he split for you. It started yesterday when you forgot the manna that he provided for you. And it started yesterday when it wasn't enough because you wanted to be in the promised land already. Because we seem stuck by the things that we want because we deserve. Because do you, have you seen us out here, God? I mean, God, have you seen, I I moved to Chicago by myself and I'm feeling lonely. And sure, I've compromised a few areas, but come on, God, like you see me, right? I can't be waiting out here forever for you to bring me my job, my mister or missus, right? God, I can't be tithing just yet because you you see it, right? You see I don't have everything you've given. And what we do is instead of building off the back of the faith on the things he's done, we tend to hold our God to the things he's yet to do. And then we have the audacity of buying fences and building them around to protect us from the God that doesn't hear, the God that doesn't listen, the God that doesn't appreciate, the God who hasn't seen my preaching gift yet, the God who hasn't mended, and the God who hasn't done enough, and the God who hasn't healed, because we stand in this place where somehow, whilst He is also being good enough to provide the very oxygen that is keeping us alive now, it's not enough. So I'll put it back to you. 
And let me just add one word to the phrase and maybe it'll hit us different. I won't say children, but let me say, do we as children struggle with forgetfulness or do we lack appreciation? Because he has been doing stuff. He has been working. He has been that God. He spent most of his scripture here saying, I was the God. Who, who was it that got you out of Egypt? Who was it that got you through? Who was it that split? Who was it that put distance between you and your captor? Who was it the one that changed your master? Who heard your prayers from heaven? I, I think it was me. Now, who forgot about that and died in the wilderness? You've got to understand that only two people made it from that land to the promised land. Only two people. And if you want to say and, and, and find a case for your disbelief, because you've got all the reasons to doubt God because you're not there yet. Isn't that what we do, right? I have reason to doubt God because I'm not there yet. I can doubt God because there's things I haven't seen yet. There's healing I haven't seen yet. God, I'm not what, I, what you said I would do yet. God, I'm gonna compromise. I'm gonna attach this part of my life with what months ago I would have said was the only thing I was aiming at, but I'm gonna attach something else to it. You know why, God? Because you didn't show up where you were supposed to show up. And what we do is we tell him everything he hasn't done, forgetting the simple fact that everyone in the Bible that walked into promise just knew how to navigate deficit. Do you know how to navigate deficit or is deficit navigating you? Is your deficit your greatest reason? Is it your idol? Is it the thing you hold before God as if that was unthought of by him? Like he didn't know. No, God starts you in a deficit for your, for your well-being. It's in the deficit that you can grow into the person that he's going to use because you can't do that in the areas of promise just yet. It is in the deficit that he starts to work conviction and hide it because it'll protect you when you're in front of the giant. It is in the deficit that he builds the kind of faith of knowing how to cry out for God for no other reason than his title alone. Can you give God praise when it's not good? Can you give God praise when it's not working out like you want? Can you give God praise when the desert feels like everything you don't have yet? I would dare say, if you can't praise God with nothing, you don't know Him. Because to know Him is to praise Him due to His titles, not to what He's provided. You don't know Him and what you are praising for or wanting or reserving your praise for is a God that can perform. But every problem that you're standing in today, it started yesterday. It started yesterday in the wilderness when you couldn't thank, when you couldn't see, when you couldn't stop. See, when God strips away the luxuries of life, what he's trying to do is take away the distractions so that you might know that there is a creator, that what? When there is nothing other than God, what does he prove? He's sufficient. He's sufficient. He's enough. But you're out here overlooking the enough, tagging all sorts of things to make it enough, because you don't know how to sit still in a wilderness. We don't know what it's like to actually be thankful and gracious to the fact that our God just set us free. Because it's kind of lonely out here in the wilderness. There ain't no Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi's super slow. Everyone else got Wi-Fi. The Malachites have Wi-Fi. Canaanites. Canaanites, super speedy. Look, those people, they've got camel races. I'd love to go see a camel race once again. Onions, garlic. Retrospectively, petty in comparison because we think that when God hasn't given you anything, that he's not giving you something. What if God's giving you something? What if God is giving you something by giving you nothing? What if God is giving you something by taking from you what you think you need? What if God is building a giant in a wilderness? What if God is, hey, know this, they came out as slaves, but they entered a nation. A nation defined by God in the four I wills in Exodus 6 was, I will make you my people. My people. You ever been somewhere and you're like, they're my people? Some of you right here, and they're going, this is not my people. <laughs> well, I'll tell you right now, I'm going to preach extra for you. You see people and they, that's my people. And people is not about culture. My people can be all sorts of people, Polish people, black people, you know, American people, like Nigerian people, uh, South American people, and you, old people, like 80 years old can be your people. When we first started the church, they wanted a person for our brand. They were like, you must give me a person. I'm like, I'm not going to give you a person because unfortunately, Jesus died for all of them, not like a branded like person, you know what I mean? But I said, I can define them by a spirit. 
I can define them by a spirit that no matter their age, their color, their background, their deficit or anything, they are people who just love God and are willing to risk it all time and time again to see Him move. That's our people. You want to know who people church is? That's our people. Our people don't build well. We don't play well with fences. Our people don't recruit to the bench. Part of our greatest problem and the reason we are so unfit spiritually is because we got saved and we want bench time. God, I need my time on the bench before I jumped on the team. God, I know I'm made to do something, but coach, keep me on the bench first because I haven't seen yet. If you don't know how to navigate deficit, deficit will never get you. And deficit will take you into a wilderness of bitterness. It'll take you into a wilderness of victim mentality. It'll take, you in a, it'll take you into a wilderness of compromise. It'll take you into a wilderness of complaint. Because if you don't understand that God is always giving you something, even when he's not giving you anything, how many of us are missing? Now know this, every man and every woman is as strong as what they can live without. You want to you know who's going to last longest? The one that can live without. So God takes us to seasons where the only thing that we are never without is his presence. Now you name me a season that the devil can take you to that you won't get through when all you need is the presence of God. You don't need the brands. You don't need the luxury. You don't need the accolades. You don't need the title in ministry because you know how to do ministry when you're not even unti- when you're untitled. Like you know how to do it. Hey, guess what? You don't need more finance to tithe. You need more faithfulness. It's his. It's his. The whole thing is his. You, whether you like that or not, it's his. You're either going to give him back what's his first or you're not. And that's up to you. You can justify it with compromise and add your theologies to it, but name me a place in the Bible where he's not first. But then we will complain that we as a people aren't where we want to be. Man, there's not enough programs for, and we ain't never been. And I hate that we don't have. Well, we don't have because all of us still have. Sometimes, do you know that the best case for most churches is that 20% of the church would would tithe? Now, let's take that to a potluck mentality. If if we as Christians showed up to potlucks the way that we show up with tithing, there'd be like, there'd be, there's just that one person, it'd be like college days, where the only person that brought food was because they were just visiting their parents. Hey, let me tell you this. I'm going to jump in my points because now that I've ruffled enough feathers, which, you know why I'm ruffling feathers? Because you don't know that you've got a wound until I bump up on it and now it's painful. You don't know you have a problem until I made you angry. Because if it's not a problem, you shouldn't be angry. Because when you're right, you're calm. Confidence isn't loud, it's quiet. And if we're confident in what we're doing, we don't get frustrated. But we're a church. And I'm preaching this way, guess what? Because we're meant to be a church. We've got to move. And if we are stuck in the wilderness, will we die like these who had their unbelief? And where does unbelief come from? We're going to paint five or six points that I've got right now as to why our unbelief has been developed. Because you and I have to get to the point where what Jake preached is usable. But I dare say that what he preached is not usable till we know how to navigate the deficit. Are you ready? Number one, the number one reason that you and I struggle with unbelief and get caught in the wilderness and die there is because of this, a rope named romance. We are being hung by a rope named romance. We are being held back by a rope named romance. It is basically our romantic perspective of how our story should be written. AKA, if you're going to rewrite the story, just say it plainly and say this, I want it my way. Usher. just happens in a split second my brain just does that stuff and it can't be stopped it's the way I've been wired or miswired there's a rope called romance in your life and it's holding you back it's holding you back from because we have a romantic view of how we will serve my God's finally one day in worship going to take from me every ounce of, 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 of insecurity And I will finally come and answer to the call that he has given me. Or I will finally, one day, I see it. I'm going to work really, really hard. And then one day I'm going to be free because I'm going to earn enough. I'm going to earn so much that I'll have enough to then pour all into the kingdom. And then all of a sudden, and it's romantic because how good would it be to not be paid for the things of ministry? Yet Bible says that we should not muzzle an ox. That those who do ministry are worthy of their reward for it. 
we have unbiblical things. Sounds like fences. Sounds like fences. Unbiblical 600 laws that were not in Deuteronomy. I think it's called the Mishnah. It's 600 laws that were about not breaking the real laws. How many times have we created a romantic view of God's path, therefore God's path is now unattractive? You know what my revelation is about marriage? It looks nothing like the movies. Like when we got married, man, I'm 100% clueless. You didn't, you didn't have to, I, I, did you just echo what I said? I'm like 100% clueless, yes, clueless. As far as clues go, you had none. But for real, man, I thought, ro- like, she, she came in with romance, and I, she, she thought we're going to be like, she thought I was going to get up in the morning and bake bread and stuff and bring it, and we're going to love, and this is going to be fantastic. And here's Chris. I was like, babe, we're married. What do you want to do? Let's go build a youth ministry. <laughs> no, 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 let's stay out all night building a youth ministry, and then let's like, get up in the morning, let's go build church again. And then let's go, and let's go, let's go work. Doesn't that sound awesome? Because how many men only want to get married so that their ministry is completed? instead of knowing that you've just married your first ministry. And Oz was frustrated too, because in the movies, it's just like rom-coms are great. That's why you're a really good boyfriend, but sometimes a really bad husband. Because anybody can play the part for an hour. That's why you are a loving, calm girlfriend, and sometimes you get a little wild as a wife. Because anybody can be a good wife or girlfriend for an hour and a half. But guess what? You can't keep up a facade when the facade is heavy. So eventually when you finally have the safety of marriage, you put the facade down and you just, it's you now. And the rope called romance is the marriage you wanted, not the marriage you're willing to build. Let me ask you a simple question in the context of marriage. We should move on because there are other ropes to talk about. But nonetheless, for the married people, how and unmarried in particular, have you ever, had, is, if you were to look at your piece of paper that has a list, and whether the list is just a better list or not a better list, whatever, draw a line in the middle. Do you have two lists? I hope you do. And it's not like, some of you are like, Plan A and Plan B. <laughs> like in Plan A, he's six foot four, but in Plan B, he's six foot three and a half. <laughs> so many girls just did this. <laughs> I have the right list. <laughs> no, you don't. It is this. Your list, and this applies to married people, because your list when you're married changes from what you who you're always still looking for who you want. In marriage, it's who you want them to become. Before marriage, it's who you want them to be. But the reason that you have two sides to that list is because it's also got to be a list for you. What are your requ- What will you bring? If all you're dreaming about is what they'll bring you, you don't understand marriage. If all you understand is what the church will bring you, you don't understand church, which is the first construct for marriage. You don't understand marriage. You don't understand church. You don't understand God. You don't understand kingdom because what you understand is you. And you is the first place that you get forgetful from, what you haven't been given yet. And that's what I call the rope called romance, the romantic view of what God's got to do for you in order to win you over and make you faithful. In fact, if God doesn't give you this romantic life that you need on the way that you're going to preach to thousands and the way that everything's going to work and your family's not going to give you any trouble and the world's going to love your Instagram and then your TikTok's going to blow up, bam, and you're going to do all these things, you know what I mean? And the world just, yes, and you're loving it, bam, and now everything's great. And all of a sudden, this rope is the very one that you won't step out from. And we are dying in the wilderness, also complaining that there's no church in the promised land. But wait, every time you say, I hope they do it, you're saying, I hope someone else does it because you are there to do it. You, you, you in the wilderness. A rope called romance. It's not going how you wish you did. But today's problems are not romantic problems. They started yesterday and they are heart problems. The heart you start your journey in with will determine whether you finish that journey. Now, the journey has an opportunity to shift your heart, but you've also got to get this thing that's in the way of your heart called pride. And if you won't tear down the fence of pride that is keeping you safe at the distance because you think no one else sees you're wrong, no, they do. 
everybody can see someone playing out of position. Number two. Know which master. The Bible says this thing, Jesus, so challenging. He's like, you can't serve two masters. And I'm like, come on, Jesus, be open-minded. <laughs> you know? Like, you, don't, you don't want to be a harsh God. It's so hard to build a church with a God that wants to be God. Now, we know, God, you created the heavens and the earth, and you put breath in our lungs, and you're the only reason that the promises that we've asked for are there, and that most of our prayers, you answer them, like, I hope I get home safely, I hope my kids are all right. They're always there, and yet I don't thank you for those. But God, can we just for a minute, even though you are who you are, can we make room for someone else that I also enjoy serving? You know what blew my mind? As a pastor, I'm still reading scriptures and going, what? I had this uh, Dominican um, uh, uh, Uber driver, and my favorite word and tone that he said it was porcos. <laughs> if you know Spanish, it's a great blend of, it's amazing, porcos. And he kept saying this all the time, in the, porcos, every time. <laughs> and when I'm reading Joshua, and I read like the last chapter of Joshua, I'm a little bit like, porcos, <laughs> like, what are you doing, Jesus? God, what is this? He says this. He, so Joshua, after all the fighting, right, it is hard moving people who sound like that, whose hearts quickly wander, who one week and it's like, ah, and next week it's like, oh, oh, oh. what, brunch? I got brunch. I know I got brunch on Sunday morning. Joshua says this, hey, we're here now and this is all yours, but you've got to make a decision. Are you going to serve God? And they're like, yeah, of course we're going to serve God. He goes, no, no, you can't serve God. You can't serve him because your hearts wander. Are you going to serve him? Because if you are going to serve him, he will keep you here. But make no mistake that if you do not serve him, he will punish you. He will turn his back towards you because this is a relationship he wants. You have walked out of Egypt with jewelry and, and favor and finance you did not earn because of a God who loves you. You walked away from a master that you did not earn or deserve because God loves you. You walked through a desert with food and you woke up without any care. Why? Because of a God who loves you. You overcame 31 kings who had land that was theirs, but I gave it to you because I have a because I am a God who loves you. I walked you through and through again and over and over and over again, proving myself to you while you tested me. Has God been proving to you his faithfulness? Even if you don't know him here today, you might be here and you're not a Christian, but you might be here because some freak accident was avoided in your life. Like you should have been dead, but you're not. You should have given up, but you haven't. You wanted to take your life, but a voice kept telling you no. And yet we are still like, where are you, God? I don't see you. He's like, I'm busy carrying you. But if you abandon the building blocks of faith from yesterday, your heart will be hardened on the day called today. Why is this message so challenging? It's so challenging because there's always a day called today. This is what he's talking about in Hebrews 4. He's like, if, if entering my rest, which is my promise and my presence, if you can enter my rest, are, are some of you tired? You know why Christian burnout happens? Because us trying to do God's work our way. I want the accolades. I want to be known. I want to be promoted. I want to be seen. I, I can't let go of the financial need at the same time as sacrifice for the kingdom. So I'm going to work 50 million jobs and try to do it. And basically what we have is two masters. Because entering the rest, the tithe and the Sabbath are two powerful Christian constructs that keep declaring. They declare. There are three things that I see that just off the top of my head that declare something about God and it is our communion it declares the Lord's death it announces it to the sickness in our bodies it announces it to the devil beyond the fence it announces it to the struggle in our heart it announces it to the flesh that my God he died a painful death so that I might have a freedom filled life number two when we rest when we don't work on the Sabbath why because we know that the master would want to call us back to work the Egyptians didn't give him rest didn't give him any rest. 
And Mighty Dollar doesn't give you any rest either. There's always a phone call to take, a conference, and something to forward. And what you've attached is your ideals with His promise. And God, I would rest, but it wouldn't be faithful for me to rest because one day I want to buy someone a church or I want to build or I want to give. And so what you're doing is you're starting to do what King Saul did. What King Saul did was when he was instructed to murder everyone and leave nothing and get rid of all the sheep and get all the livestock, he kept some. Because it's like, surely it would be good to bring a sacrifice to God. And this is where the phrase starts and the Bible truth that God wants obedience more than sacrifice. How many of us are out in the wilderness sacrificing because we serve two masters? God doesn't want your sacrifice. He doesn't need your work ethic. He wants your obedience. But you are thinking that what you need to give God is your sacrifice. I'm going to work, serve the devil. I'm going to work and serve the economy. I'm going to go work and serve my pride. I'm going to go work and serve the idols that I have built over my life of being known, of being accepted, of being wealthy, of being well put together, of being used or whatever it might be. And then I will bring those to God and lay them down and say, God, aren't you pleased? And God's like, no, what I am pleased with is obedience. If you notice that there was a man that was obedient to the point where he brought his son up a mountain and while he was ready to sacrifice that which he waited for all his life, I provided the sacrifice for him. We think we need to provide the sacrifice. No, God will do that. We think we need to provide what we give him. No, God will do that. We are sick and we are tired and we are fighting an enemy but we're, bad, we're so bad at fighting because we can't even identify we've got two masters at the end of that thing that, that last chapter in Joshua he basically says well okay so you're saying you're going to serve God I need you to get rid of your idols every idol you've got that you've picked up from other places every battle the people of Israel came away with an extra idol which means this God's checking them in chapter 23 because he knows that they've always had wandering hearts. I think they couldn't bring themselves to obedience so they looked for compromise and at every battle they took a God with them, an idol with them. Christians, we do it too. Some of us have had to weather storms of sickness as close as our children. And in that season, we made it through. If you don't have that season, think of one like it. We didn't have the finance. And when we didn't have the finance, we felt stupid and irresponsible. And we felt like all the times we served God, it was a mistake. And the enemy, the devil, who helps us build fences, stood there telling us, you're only here because you didn't, you should be able to pay for this bill. You should be able to do this. You should be able to know that they've got the best care in the world. You should, you should, you should, you went went too far. And then we come out of seasons like that. And what we do is we leave a victory that only God could have given us, but we take an idol with us. And the idol now is provision. I will never be in a place ever again where I am solely relying on my Father, the Creator of the universe, to get me through. No, next time what I will do is I will rely on the Creator of the universe, but I'll also have this other little idol with me too. Now, I'm not talking about the fact that we're supposed to be broke. I'm not saying that. If I'm saying that, then, geez, I can't even fix that. You need a whole other three messages to understand that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, that when faith puts you to a battle that you almost lost, we tend to come out choosing comfort over creator. And therefore we take idols that might keep us comfortable. I wanna ask you, when was the last battle that you came out where you should have been praising God, but you came out with an extra idol? You used to serve, you don't serve it anymore. You used to sing, you don't sing anymore. You used to pray, you don't pray anymore. You used to be faithful, you don't have faithful anymore. You used to believe in where God placed you, you don't believe anymore. Because the devil made you feel stupid for God was actually sitting there celebrating your faithfulness because he doesn't need sacrifice, he wants obedience. Can you stand where he wants you to stand? Can you run where he wants you to run? Life is not difficult. Christian burnout is when we do God's things our way. 
I want to know that at the end of every sun, at the end of every week when the sun goes down, I want to know two things: that I honor God with my first fruits and I honor Him with my time. Why? Because every single time that I tithe and every single time I rest with my family in the presence of God, looking up, and I have not been good at this, and this is something that Ords and I both are going, man, we're gonna we're gonna adjust this because we have not been good with our rest. We've been good with our tithe, but we've not been good with our rest. And the church makes its way into our day off, and it makes its way into our family moment, and it makes its way into our dinner table and it makes its way everywhere in our life and it's got to stop because what we are saying is that church is built on us if we don't take that call it won't exist if we don't help that person they can't make it no the church is not built on us it's built on the creator of that of heaven and earth and so therefore we will rest and we're going to rest because I need to rest so that you know how to rest so that every week what I declare to the world and my goals and his promise is that I serve one master and I will declare that master in my tithe and I will declare it with my time called time off. I will declare that master. I want to encourage you to do the same. Third point, and I got to wrap up so quick. Okay, I'm going to go fly through them. I'm just going to fly through them. Okay, ready? Shut the front door. Shut the front. Everyone say it with me. Shut the front door. Shut the front door. Like, we got to shut the front door. What I mean is this. What's the main point of attack that you keep leaving open? What's the front door for you? What is it? You got to shut it. You got to shut the front door. Whatever it is, you got to shut it. You got to learn to switch the mind off. You got to, you got to learn to stop going to that place. You got to stop speaking to that person. You got to stop dwelling. You've got to learn how to shut the front door because if you don't, the enemy will keep walking through it. He doesn't need a new play when the old one's still working. Now, I know you've got the windows open so you can hear God, but you've also got the devil's door open so he can hear you and you can hear him. It's not great when you hear them both, specifically if you are not strong. How do you shut the front door? Number one, you shut it with truth. Truth is not what you've experienced. That is fact. Let's just start there, and I need you to take that away this week, okay? Some of you have called your truth a fact, your fact a truth, basically meaning that yes, you have experienced it, yes, you have seen it, and that is a fact, but that is not truth. Truth works outside of time because it is an actual attribute that is only encompassed by God Himself. In fact, He is so true that He only swears upon Himself because He cannot lie. He is the only binding factor of this universe that we live in. So therefore, when we say truth, what we are saying is, I live a lie that I will never be enough. I live a lie that I will not have enough. I live a lie that time, 24 hours in a day and seven days a week is not enough. I live a lie that this marriage cannot turn around. I live a lie that I'll never be married. I live a lie that I'll never be all the lies in the world. I live a lie that if someone corrects me, they don't love me. That's not true. People only correct those they love. So if you're running from correction because you think it's rejection, it's not. What you're looking for is not acceptance. You're looking for agreeance, which is a byproduct of pride. You're so proud that you can't be wrong. So you only want people and only deem love as those who agree with you. So your highest construct is being right. But I think the highest calling of love is for somebody to stick with me when they don't agree with me. If everybody that agrees with me stuck with me, there's no prize in that at all. You just think like me. Pride, shut the front door. Four, nevertheless, the art of pushing through the why not. The nevertheless is the moment in your life where you can sit back at God and go, but there's no reason that'll work. There's no way we're big enough to take over those lands because we are like grasshoppers in their sight. At the end of the day, they could never know the way that they are seen. They basically dictated the world around them by the way they saw themselves. Maybe the problem isn't that someone gaslit you. Maybe you just don't believe in you. And therefore, everything they say is an attack. Every time, every moment that you look at a text and that speech, that little bubble is going, every second is a further nail in the belief that you're not valuable to get back to quicker. It can get that small. Why not? Is, what, is something that you and I need to navigate. And we have to then follow why nots with this very beautiful, faith-filled Christian statement, nevertheless. This is not reasonable, I see it. It's not possible, I see it. It's not reasonable that we're gonna buy a land. We are gonna buy, a, like we're gonna buy a church in Chicago proper. 
It's not reasonable that we will probably have to go to the closing table with $6 million. It's not reasonable that we'll be in cities around the world and we've been believing and pushing and doing. It's not reason. No, but nevertheless, you said so, didn't you, God? And if you said it, who am I? I'm not gonna just sacrifice for you. No, I will be obedient. You want me to preach it? I'll preach it. You want me to say it? I'll say it. You know the biggest fence in your pastor's life is that other pastors told me that I've gotta be a little bit more believable. I've gotta be a bit more reasonable because reasonable, that, that builds confidence. Don't say outlandish things, Chris. You gotta look like you know what you're doing. So I built a fence, which fences in the Bible were the construct of Pharisees and what they wanted other people to do. It was what was status quo, standard. And so I built a fence and I started to try to get a little bit more reasonable with the vision of People Church. But guess what? I won't do it because it is unreasonable. And I, unfortunately and fortunately, have been gifted with faith. You know why? Because I was depressed and I was mentally ill. And I was, I did stand on a, a sit on an operating table with a fractured back, wake up the next morning and the doctor said, it's gone. And I was like, oh, thank you. He goes, don't thank me. Thank God, because it was healed overnight. But my x-ray at 545 said that it wasn't healed and that I still needed surgery the next Next morning, but I stood there, and my greatest faith moment at 14 years old was when I looked at God and said, God, this is broken, but nevertheless, I'm gonna believe you're gonna fix it. It didn't make sense, but I don't need to make sense of a God who stands outside of time. No, my job is not to make sense of God, my job is to witness my God working in my life so others can witness it too. We need to push through the ridiculous with a nevertheless. What are you gonna say nevertheless to this week? You gotta say it to the doctor's report, and you gotta say it to the stats and you've got to say it to the economy because we are not held together by what the world is held together by. We have a creator and we honor one master and that master gives us reason to rest and have freedom. That's what we do. Last two, I'll be real quick. All aboard. We're going somewhere. You, man, no, no, I'm not going to do it justice. I, I should just finish. I'm going to finish. I might do it another time. I don't know. Do, do we have, no, we don't have time. People need to eat. People, people. Man can't live off bread alone. (laughs) And all the hungry people are like, boo, boo. All right, who's got some food? We'll multiply it. Actually, you know why the crowd ate? And you know why most churches don't have buildings? It's not that no one had food amongst the crowd. There was just one boy who had the willingness to part with it. It's not feasible that in 20,000 people, only one person had food. No, it was in 20,000 people, only one person wanted to give it up. All aboard, we're going somewhere. And I want you to know this. I know you're an individual, and I know your mum told you you're your own person, and society is telling you you're, we're all, you're an individual. But guess what? To God, we're His people. And He moved His people into, into the promised land. We got to get better at being a people because I think we're too prideful in our individuality. We gotta be a people. He moves a people. We're moving. No, we will move into Mexico City. We will move into Barcelona. Yeah, we failed once. We'll go again. We will move into our own building. We will move into a counseling center where we will make it affordable and available for people that need it. We will do micro enterprise in the South Side and the West Side and in third world nations around the world. We will, we will do it. We will. And I'm declaring it. And I'll tell you why, because that's where we're going. And the train is leaving. And I want to tell you that when you attach yourself to a God promise and in a God direction, you get the blessing of the overflow. When you can get around where the Creator's moving, you get the excess of the Creator's movement. Next one. I just want to finish on this. This leads into my question to you, whether you know Jesus or not. I want to know, like, is this your moment, you know? Like you collided with the Creator, like smack, and you're like, God, I can't lie that you're real. I don't get you, but you're real. How did this man know how I feel? How did he know what I think? Maybe because I post it all the time on social media, but nonetheless, how did he know? This point is for both Christians and those who are yet to become a Christian, a follower of Christ. Subtly sedated. The devil is the master of subtly sedating you making you fall asleep at the wheel of your calling, 
making you fall at the wheel of your promise. He needs you to, at just one point, switch the ratios of your belief. I said earlier and I started that my dad gave me a powerful poem and it said that life is 95% attitude and 5% that happens to you. I gotta tell you that when I embraced that in my life, something shifted and it took me from being a victim to being someone that could walk in victory. And I tell you, I have no greater reason to believe that than now as a believer of Christ because I have Him for me and if He is for me, who could be against me? But guess what? A few years of ministry and a promise did. You know what the worst thing about a promised land is? It looks so good and you can see it. Ugh, hate it. I hate that I could see our church in the future. I hate that I could feel our building. I hate that I know what the platform feels like. I hate that I know what it's gonna feel like to preach in other cities around the world. I hate that I hear the testimonies of young people getting just saved and set free of cutting and depression and all the things. I can't stand it. You know why? Not because I don't want it, but because it's a tension that is so hard to bear. Because I'm not there, I'm here. I'm here. And the rope called romance at first thought I'd get there in 10 days. But unfortunately, God needed to build me because every no leads me to a bigger yes. Unfortunately, God needed to make a giant before I could face one. Unfortunately, I needed convictions that buried deep in the DNA of my soul, not in the back blocks of my diary that I'll never pick out again. No, my God needed someone that knew how to look like a fool in front of many and if any, if he's ever gonna be there. And what that does is this, years of the wilderness makes a callus around the heart and I got and I forfeited the day called today. I started feeling sorry for myself about the day called yesterday and about the day called tomorrow that will never come. And I forfeited today. And what I started to do is I went from 95.5 to, you know, 90.10. And then after four years of this and going for it and preaching it and giving everything and being hungry and feeling like a failure, I have wanted to quit multiple times. I feel crazy. But I can't deny that I heard him. I see it. I see that promised land. But at some point, I went from 95.10 to 60.40. And then I went to 30.70 until I was the victim in this game called life. But that says that my God is not good and my God is not true. No, He is true. And I will make it there. And so will we. Why? Because I will not be suddenly sedated by the time it takes to get to my promise. No, every single day called today, I will praise my God. Every day today, I will choose my master. Every day today, I will lay down my idols. Every day today I will announce the Lord's death I will tithe I will rest because my God is who he says he is he healed me on an operating table he healed me of cancer he healed my family he brought this church out of a pandemic and he will do what he said he will because he is not a liar and he is not a man that would lie but he is the same God yesterday today and forever so because of that church we will embrace our today so we will not be suddenly sedated in the name of Jesus can I get an amen in this place If you're in this room and you're saying, man, I need that, guess what? My God isn't a respecter of people. I'm not special. I was just pretty broken and pretty willing. Now, if you are like me and you are pretty broken and pretty willing and you need a God that could get you from where you are to where you need to be, I'm not promising you Disney. Let's get rid of that rope called romance. Some things will drop off. Some of you with addictions, it'll drop off. There are other things that won't fall so easy. Not because he is not able, but my God is a God of process. You know why he's a God of process? Because he's a God of patience. You know why he's a God of patience? Because he needs you to get the time. He needs to give you the benefit of time so that you could actually cross the line. Because if he didn't give you patience, you wouldn't qualify. Now I could give you and share with you Jesus. That's what I got for you. That's all I got. That's what this church has. We don't have a shiny building yet. We don't have that, but I could give you Jesus. I could give you the very same God that actually overcame my depression, my angst, and my illnesses. I could give you that God. And if you're in this room and you need Jesus, I don't, I'm not asking you for religion. We're not doing that. We're preaching against fences right now. I'm asking you, are you really ready to follow a God who will lead you out of almost? If that is you, and you once followed Him, but like me, your ratio split from 95 to 95.5 to maybe you know, 10.90, where everything was stacked against you, well, maybe this is your day. 
Maybe this is your day. You draw a line in the sand and you say, this is the day I leave the wilderness. It might take time, but I know that you will do it because you are my God and I've never been alone. If that is you, I'm not gonna bring you down the front and embarrass you, but I wanna know who I'm praying for. If it is you, front to back, left to right, unapologetically on the count of three, raise one hand, raise both hands because the devil's gonna see it and it's gonna make him angry and that's awesome. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. All over this room, both hands being raised all over this place, all over this place. People saying yes to Jesus. People saying yes to Jesus. Jesus. People saying yes to Jesus. People coming home. People, church, this is not a Sunday. This is a lifestyle. Let's give it up for Jesus. Come on. Hey, we're only starting. 2023, we're only starting. I want you to pray a prayer with me. It's inviting Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior. It is the first thing that you are going to announce that the devil's going to be scared of in a long time because he knows that he's lost license. License is his right. He doesn't have it anymore. Are you ready? Pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to my heart as my Lord and Savior. I thank you. You forgive me of all my sin. I have a hope, a future through a relationship with you. I thank you. You protect me. Give me the freedom to run for the promises you have for me that I might share and speak and reflect your glory so that others might find you too. I call myself a Christian and thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen.